Welcome to Light and Lens. I am Nabila Rahman. Today, hosting this very important session, we have some brilliant and very important scholars and policy makers with us today, and I'm honored to introduce them. We have with us Dr. Iftekar Ahmed Chaudhary. He is currently the Principal Research Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS, at the National University of Singapore. He is also he, the former foreign advisor of the caretaker government of Bangladesh. During his four decades of public service career, he has held many posts of ambassador and permanent rep representative to the United Nations in New York and in Geneva. He was knighted by the Pope in 1999. In 2004, the New York City Council issued a proclamation naming Dr. Chaudhry as one of the world's leading diplomats, acknowledge his global contribution to advancing welfare elevating poverty and combating terrorism. So welcome aboard. And we also have Dr. Ruan Zongze, Executive Vice President, China Institute of International Study, Beijing. He served in the Chinese Embassy in the United Kingdom as Second Secretary and later First Secretary. Dr. Zhuan also served in the Chinese Embassy in the United States as Minister Counsel. Currently, he's Executive Vice President and a Senior Research Fellow at CIIS. He is also Editor-in-Chief of the CIIS Journal, China International Studies, and a member of the UNDP Human Development Report Advisory Panel. Welcome on board. Welcome to UNB. Welcome to Bangladesh, to both of you. So, um, you have been associated, I'm going to ask Dr. Zonze first, you've been associated with the China Institute of International Studies since 1988. Would you kindly tell us how does this think tank contribute to the China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and what are the key foreign policy issues it deals with? Well, thank you for having me. Um, China Institute of International Studies was founded back in 1956, right after the founding of People's Republic of China. And uh, we are a think tank of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so we try to cover the whole world. We have a number of research departments and also a number of research centers. And so we are, number one, uh, provide a public uh, uh, analysis for the policymakers. In the same time, we are pretty active in participating in the public policy debate in China. OK. And uh, Dr. Iftikhar, I just want to ask you another question. You're aware about the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's visit to China that's happening very soon in July. How do you see that with the progression of the relationship between Bangladesh and China? What is your expectation? The Prime Minister's visit is going to be a very important one. That's my view. Uh, it'll be important uh, not, on, not only in uh, terms of bilateral relations, though also that, but from a regional perspective as well. Uh, she's going to Dali and for first uh, to uh, participate in the World Economic Forum uh, meeting, and thereafter she'll go to uh, Beijing and uh, and relate to, uh, speak to the Chinese leadership. Uh, uh, Bangladesh-China uh, relations are strong, of course, but it's growing stronger by the day because of the huge Chinese investments in our infrastructural de development, partly because of the Bangladesh Belt and Road Initiative and also because in purely on bilateral terms. Okay. And your thoughts on the Prime Minister's visit? Yeah, absolutely. I think it will be a, a, a wonderful visit, a very important one. As, uh, by the way, I was honored to receive her in my institute. She was giving a speech in my institute as an honor of guest uh, when her last visit to China. Mm -hmm. So I think at this time, I think China and Bangladesh relationship is uh, flourishing and uh, it will go even stronger. Mm -hmm. Two things, the first one, China put forward this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. That is the platform for bilateral, multilateral collaboration. Secondly, I'm also very encouraging to learn that in. Uh, Bangladesh yourself wrote out a very ambitious and a promising vision for your future about 2024 and about 40 or something. So I think uh, there are numerous synergy opportunity for together to work on the better future. Mm. Thank you. 
So as you talked about a very important point, the BRI, the, Bangladesh, the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, that has, uh, I mean, of course, it's going to strengthen our ties even more. What, uh, when do you see it getting implemented? Because we've been hearing about it, the whole uh, infrastructure development project, when do you think it's going to start? I'm going to give the floor, whoever wants to answer. What is, what is our biggest challenge? Where, why aren't we kind of seeing any, any progression? I, probably I, I like to share with one of my observations. In China's experience in the last 40 years of opening up and reform, this policy transformed China enormously. One of the lessons we learn from that, if you want to develop your economy, the f how to build a road, basic infrastructure, mm -hmm. always comes to the first. Mm -hmm. So in order to get rich, build road first. Mm -hmm. That is a very popular slogan in China. So I do see here is an enormous opportunity for Bangladesh. I think uh, to improve the tra uh, traffic, improve the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There is a lot to think, not issue to be uh, addressed and try to improve the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Then incrementally you can move on to create uh, other uh, higher quality of job and a higher quality of uh, infrastructure as well. Mm -hmm. So it should be step by step. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah, that is true. I broadly agree with mm -hmm. uh, what uh, Professor Ruan has said. Uh, this is a mega project to China. This is the biggest uh, development initiative the world has ever seen, as a matter of fact. It links about 60 countries uh, uh, to China and also provides infrastructural support, much needed infrastructural support uh, to, to the, these countries. There is also a huge finance gap in the requirement for infrastructures in these countries, and the BRI, uh, BRI initiative will provide that. Of course, one must remember that, uh, uh, like all ma major projects, uh, this has also been critiqued. There are some fears of debt trap that you owe too much and you are not able to pay. And there have been some examples of that, as in Sri Lanka. But this is not a project where one size fits all. Uh, we are learning as we go along. China has held two summits in this regard, and China has adapted uh, itself uh, to these projects, as have the countries who are receiving uh, receiving these funds. So I think this is a fund that, uh, which I like to believe, flows from uh, the whole original concept of China dream, something that the globe will tremendously profit from. And the idea that uh, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, measures from which all participants win is something essentially Chinese, the idea of a win-win mm -hmm. uh, a, a project. So BRI could be one such. Can I just add one thing? I think one thing should be underscored with regard to the Belt and Road Initiative. The principle, what kind of a guideline for us to work together? The principle has been out there very crystally clear and recognized not only China but also uh, our stakeholder and the partners. The principle is wide consultation, joint contribution, and the mutual benefit. Otherwise, it will not going to be sustainable. So nobody has, uh, can monopolize the project itself. So it must uh, worked out uh, by the partners, uh, participants uh, concerned. And this Belt and Road Initiative is also inclusive and it's open and it generates lots of opportunities and the benefits. Fundamentally important thing is how to bring the benefit to trickle down to the people. This is what we call the high quality development. High quality means you should bring the benefit to the people. Secondly, how to ensure the projects that they can financially sustainable sustainable and also environmentally sustainable. So in last April, China held the second Belt and Road Initiative, highlight this uh, high quality development and it will make a Belt and Road Initiative uh, green, clean, and also a mutual benefit. Of course, absolutely. And so that's why, uh, what are the initiatives that we can take to implement the Bangladesh, China, India, and Myanmar economic corridor under the BRI in a faster way? Well, this is uh, something has been developed for a while, uh, mm -hmm. discussed for a while. 
I think now maybe this is a time to move forward to this economic corridor because this is a demonstration of a multilateral cooperation because mm -hmm. China is in, India is in, Bangladesh, Myanmar is in that. So it is a collective teamwork. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think now what we can do is together to, to gear up and to make sure that it will deliver and hopefully there will be some early harvest to demonstrate, to, to in increase, to build the confidence for the future. Uh, absolutely. You see, the, the problem with BCIM so far has been that it has been lacking in projects. Mm. Uh, this uh, initiative gives BCIM a tremendous opportunity to step in in, in the development efforts. So. Uh, Another thing that we are doing through BCIM is also using Chinese BRI funds as part funding for BCI, broadly BCIM projects, as is happening in Pyra and other places. So we are discovering new ways of activating these kind of uh, um, uh, plurilateral uh, coordination among countries in aiming at development. And the, the Chinese initiative is being very helpful in this regard. Uh, can I just add one more thing about the funding? It's very critical importance because how to get guarantee the financial f of a fund is uh, so important at all. And let me put it this way. And China itself, we can provide uh, certainly some of the funding, but now what more? We invited the other financial institutions like uh, the World Bank and also Asia Development Bank, mm -hmm. AIIB, and all these that are also very interested in finding the projects under the framework of Belt and Road Initiative. To diversify the funding means make sure that the project will be more uh, sustainable and have a greater um, opportunity to be a successful one. And it will also bring more benefits to the stakeholders. And try to also bring the PPP model, mm -hmm. private and uh, public, public. Uh, sectors, uh, to mobilize them to participate in this. So it is a very open and inclusive effort. Very good. And uh, are you getting the support from India in this whole uh, Belt and Road Initiative? Yes and no. When I say yes, we just discussed the BCIM, mm. which involved India. India. India is a part of that. However, I recognize that there are some reservations from the India side about the CPAC. Mm. Never mind. I'm, uh, having said this, the other thing, China and India, we have enormous uh, uh, collaboration with each other. So I think there is uh, also the opportunity is out there. Of course, these Belt and Road Initiative projects, they are based on voluntary basis. Mm. There is no such kind of compulsory thing at all. If you are ready, you can join in. If, you're, if you don't feel happy, you can opt out. Mm. Absolutely, yeah, that, that is true, and that is the point I was making, that in projects where India can co-fund, uh, India can come forward and has come forward. Uh, with regard to CPEC in Pakistan, the China-Pakistan initiative, India has a specific problem with regard to the part of the project that runs through Kashmir, mm. because India claims that uh, it's Indian territory. But where India does not have problems of that kind, I do not see why Indian support should not be forthcoming, if it is to India's benefit as well. Uh, uh, one more thing, and I don't think China-India relationship will be handicapped by the possible collaboration or not under the framework of BRI. So let me put it this way. The BRI cooperation will not define the China-India relationship. We have much wider area and fields to work with each other. Good, very good. And time will tell. So uh, let's bring uh, the discussion to home ground. There's a pub perception in the public domain that China is not doing enough to mount the pressure on Myanmar to take uh, the Rohingyas back who are living in Cox's Bazar, as you know, for long. What are your thoughts or comments regarding this matter? Well, I think uh, basically let's get the uh, problem right. It is essentially the problem between uh, Bangladesh and uh, Myanmar. 
And what China can do is a positive role we can play in facilitating your dialogue. So I don't see that kind of a role just now you made to say China is not doing enough is accurate at all. As a matter of fact, because of the Chinese involvement, I think that will give a better chance to, for, for you to, I mean, to have a better understanding with each other. Because China will not go into force any kind of solution to either of them. What we can do is just for help. Okay, your thoughts? Well, yes, yeah. you see, of course, this is a major uh, issue with regard to, uh, to Bangladesh. Uh, sometimes when, uh, uh, when these uh, uh, decisions are not taken in an overt manner, there are back-channel negotiations and discussions. We are not always aware of what is happening in, in that area. But the fact remains, as uh, the Bangladesh Foreign Minister Momen has said, that Bangladesh will raise this uh, with uh, the Chinese. And this will, I believe, feature in the conversation between, uh, between uh, Prime Minister, yes, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, and the Chinese leadership. So as you said earlier on one occasion, time will tell. Okay, very good. So hopefully we'll get some answers. <laughs> and another very sensitive topic, uh, there's concerns that's been raised in the international media on the issue of the treatment of Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. Senior officials, UN officials also made visits to China in this connection. Your views, your comments on this topic. Well, it, it is uh, quite clear China guarantee the freedom of religious belief in China. Mm -hmm. You can believe either of the religions, you can also not believe the religions. You have the freedom to choose. What China has do or has been doing is try to safeguard the human rights to promote the product, to, to promote the development of the people in Xinjiang at large. Because there are numerous, many others ethnic groups and the people lived in Xinjiang that need a stable, peaceful, secure environment. But we have, what had happened in the 1990s, there are a bunch of uh, terrorist attack. And so such kind of a radical uh, extremism and a terrorism that posed a threat, not only for certain people, but also for the whole society. So I think Chinese government uh, took a very responsible role and a re very responsible approach to try to direct, de radicalize the situation and also provide a better, peace, stable, prosperous uh, environment for the people in Xinjiang. Do you have anything to say? Well, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, Professor Ruan Zhongzhi has uh, elaborated the Chinese position on this, which mm -hmm. is extremely, extremely important. Uh, uh, there is no denying that there is a perception that problem exists. And we hope that uh, the resolution on the part of China that we have seen to address a problem effectively, it will be done in this case as well. And very soon, we shall see the, uh, the issue uh, move closer towards the resolution to the satisfaction of all parties. And we shall hope and pray for it, of course. Of course, and yeah. The US government has extended additional tariff on the remaining $300 billion of imports from China in May, which covers items like apparel and footwear. The additional tariff, known as the punitive uh, tariff, may range up to 25% and may come into effect by June of 2019, this month. What are the impacts you foresee on the global ec economy? And is the trade war putting China-US ties at risk? Well, it would be a terrible bad news to the world economy. The world economy has been struggling from recovering from the financial crisis, what happened 10 years ago. Pretty unsettling, unstable. Now the unilateralism to use a tariff as a weapon, that's wrong, that's a mistake and it will hurt the global economic growth, it will hurt the global production chain, and nobody will be safe from that. So at this moment, the challenge is we are all of us confront the downward pressure of the economic growth. And one of the source, one of the reason is the trade 
attention started from the U.S. side, and this has been recognized by the world. One more thing I like to uh, highlight here: China's economy is pretty strong, very resilient. We have the largest middle-income population, and the Chinese economy, the driving force of Chinese economy, has been shifted from the export to the domestic consumption. So this will make our economy strong, and any risk will be controllable. Okay. Well, yes, indeed, uh, the, all our eyes are focused on the upcoming meeting between uh, Presidents uh, Xi Jinping and Donald Trump on this. Uh, uh, we, we, we hope that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the issues which are somewhat complex are, are actually resolved, as I had said earlier in the seminar. Um, I cited the Chinese court that uh, uh, in, in battles such as this, uh, when a general wins, he does so on the, uh, on the skeletons of thousands of soldiers, you see. So everybody loses uh, in, in, in a situation like this. So not only there is no win-win, there is lose-lose for everyone. So therefore, uh, I hope uh, that meeting is productive. Uh, if the Chinese feel that the whole idea is to contain China, uh, or constrain China in any way, I'm afraid uh, this will be create a, a difficult situation. But my hunch is uh, uh, it will not be, there will not be an easy resolution, but we will not move to uh, greater levels of conflict on this. In after, after all, I strongly believe China-U.S. relationship is not a zero-sum one. The rise of China does not mean the demise of the United States. As a matter of fact, the rise of China means China has a greater power, greater responsibility, greater resources in contributing in addressing the global challenges all we confront. So that China is a force of peace and we also try to protect and be a responsible stakeholder of the international system. And the international system benefits enormously from China's role. Look at uh, what happened in 10 years ago about the financial crisis. China alone, in the last 10 years, China contributed 30% of their world economic growth, much larger than the US plus the American. If we plus the other developing countries together, they contribute to more than 80% of the economic growth. So the rising China really generates greater responsibility and also opportunities Absolutely. for the world. One Absolutely. thing we see that you see if the purpose of global diplomacy over the last few years was to make China an important stakeholder and a responsible player in the international system, that has occurred. That Absolutely. Is Very good. So what are the steps that you would recommend Bangladesh to, to take to enhance its export to China? Well, I think uh, more mutual exchange or visits, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the young people, mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. and the scholars, median people, and uh, apart from the official yeah, of course. lines, we need to do more uh, grassroots uh, exchange with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make Bangladesh voice being heard in China, Chinese voice being heard here. So I think try to reach out with each other. I, I strongly believe Bangladesh, you are in the right position and uh, you are in the best shape to modernize your country. And I think uh, there's a numerous political commitment for that. You deserve a better future. And ch from China's own experience, it uh, took us uh, for sec decades of uh, experimental and also some very innovative, uh, pioneering work. I'm sure there is a lot to share with each other between China and uh, Bangladesh. Yes, we had, as we had discussed in the, in the uh, uh, deliberations in the symposium earlier, there is such a thing as hard connectivity, which is the infrastructural connections, and there is also the soft connectivity, which is something that the professor has just been speaking about. Mm. And uh, w without de-emphasizing hard connectivity, if a greater emphasis is put on soft conne connectivity, that will most certainly help in this respect. We had also identified an element of 
what he called a Bangladesh deficit on the Chinese screen. In other words, not enough was uh, known or talked about Bangladesh in China. But that can be overcome through this kind of expanded soft connectivity, and I believe that will help resolve some of the problems. That and also, the, maybe the deficit from China. And we also need China. to yes. make our Chinese voice be heard here. Yes. And uh, not just as the Western reports or reviews or something. But you're not doing too badly in this, <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> well, uh, so thank you so much for both of your time. And I, and I think and I feel, actually, and for all the reading and all what we're watching online, the news that, yes, China is the next big superpower. Bangladesh is also coming as the middle-income country. Yeah, and yeah, both yeah. of us together, being in Asia, having the geopolitical... Uh, regional hub and being in the center of Asia can of course grow with each other get opportunities from each other learn from each other and of course with the BRI and all these new uh, infrastructure development projects coming up that I feel like it's a win-win situation and I hope that uh, you come again with your team with your experts and we get a chance from Bangladesh the people go with the soft skills and learn from the Chinese people also and from knowledge sharing, from infrastructure sharing and support and of course bilateral trades, we can only grow and get better and hopefully reach where our ambitions and goals are. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for this amazing session and uh, hope to have the next Light and Lens again. Thank you.